Okay, welcome to Sacred Account Saturday. I'm Jerry Feta, owner, founder, CEO of Wealth Dynamics. And um, I'm excited about today's course. We do these every Saturday. Okay, and the focus is on the sacred account. Okay, if you don't know what the sacred account is, if you don't know who I am, um, I want to take a minute just to introduce myself and kind of talk a little bit about the concept that we're going over today. Um, so my company, Wealth Dynamics, we help families, individuals, um, entrepreneurs, business owners, um, you name it, learn the truth about money, right? We help you help you become financially educated, build financial solvency, and then, you know, achieve greater financial freedom in life, and then have the ability to share that with others. And so that's a big part of what I do. That's a big part of what my passion is. Um, and a big part of what we're going to cover today. Okay, now before we jump into this, you know, this is a topic on finances. I cover this every single week. I always have. Um, the first thing that I want to make sure everyone has is a reason to be here. Okay, if you're, if you're watching, you know, what, what interested you in this course today? Right, we're specifically talking about the sacred account. We're specifically talking about life insurance. And so I want you to think about like, like you know, do I have a sacred account? Am I learning how to use it better? Is it something maybe I don't have yet? And I want to get more data or more info on, um, you know, maybe I have an opposing viewpoint and I'm, I'm, I'm willing and interested in learning why, why it might be different and, and what else is out there. I mean, just get that first before we get started. Okay. The second thing is I want to encourage everyone watching that this can be learned, right? This is not a, a complex subject. This is not something that's unknowable. And so if you're watching this, you know, realize all of finances comes down to basic math and vocabulary. Right. And so if you can understand the basic math that's being used and you can understand the vocabulary that's being used, you can learn and understand finances. Right. Luckily, we all have dictionaries on our phones. Right. We all have, you know, uh, calculators. We all have the ability to Google things. And so there's really no reason not to understand finances. And when you look at it from the standpoint of, you know, money is something that we're all involuntarily opted into. Right. It's it's right up there with eating, sleeping, gravity, breathing. Like as soon as you're born, part of the rules is at some point you're going to have to get a job. You're going to have bills and expenses and you've got to be able to pay for those. Right. And so it's something that we, we would be foolish not to know about, right, to live our entire lives and not understand money. Yet that's what so many of us go through life doing. And so I grew up that way. I started learning about finances. I realized, hey, this is not that hard. It's, it's more, you know, when you look at like why people say finances are hard, usually it's the terminology right? You get a simple concept, like let's say a stock, right? Okay. I'm going to buy ownership in that company. I want equity. Great. That's pretty simple, right? I give them money. They give me equity. If they make profit, they pay me some of that profit and that's how it should work. But then we enter the scene banks and wall street, right? They're, they're, they're there to convince you that they need them. Otherwise they won't be able to sell us and, and you their products and services. So they have to complicate the idea of a stock. Right now, there's all these different rules and terms and vocabulary so that when we look at it, we're like, I can't understand this. I need somebody to explain it to me. Let me pay them. Right. Nothing wrong with paying someone for a service, but you've got to look at, OK, well, could I understand this myself? Right. Especially with something as important as investing. Could I understand it myself? Because when I understand it myself, I get more control. Right. I get more, more, more knowledge on the subject. I can be more responsible as an investor. Right. So this is one of the reasons why I'm so big on financial education. The second one is getting rid of the idea that I know it all. Right. Nobody likes a know it all except for the know it all themselves. If I think I know it, I'm not going to learn anything new. I'm going to be closed up. I'm going to be like, OK, I've heard this before, you know, or I've got, you know, I've either heard this before or I've got fixed ideas and I disagree because of this, this thing conflicting with my fixed ideas. OK, a fixed idea on finances would be something that we picked up. We learned from someone. We heard it you know, secondhand water cooler, financial advice, whatever it might've been. We heard it from mom, dad, brother, sister, sibling, spouse, doesn't matter. And we never inspect where it came from. And we never inspect, is it real? Is it true? Does it apply? Right. And then we just go with it. Okay. I, I heard one of those these this week and I was like, well, wait, this is not, this is not actually true. When you play it out, this is not something that actually works. It's nice. And people say it a lot, but it's not actually true. That's a fixed idea. Right. So Unplugging from those, being willing to learn. The first step in being, being willing to learn is being willing to um, face the fact that I don't know everything. That's the necessity for learning. Okay. So I want to make sure that we're there mentally before we jump into today's course. And then finally, ask your question, guys. I like to go live. I like to chat. Um, so if you have questions, if you're on Zoom, drop them in the chat throughout. Okay. I will mic up uh, throughout the middle towards the end. 
um, and I will answer your questions. If you're on Facebook, drop them. If you're on the YouTube or, or you know, wherever watching the replay on our on our list or on our social media platforms, definitely comment. We'll answer back and we'll definitely make sure that we get to your questions as well. And then finally, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you guys can see this. If you are not yet a client of my company, my number one goal today is for you to become one. Okay. The way that you do that is by getting a copy of my book, Blueprints of Financial Freedom. Okay, you can go to jerryfetta.com forward slash B2F promo. Let me go ahead and um, put this here for you really quick so you can see it. Okay, so go to jerryfetta.com forward slash B2F promo. And that's where you can get a copy of my book, right? This is going to give you a lot more than we're going to cover in the webinar today. We're covering literally one little subtopic -top from this book. Right. So the book, it's completely free. You cover your shipping with this book. You also get a, uh, a course supervisor that makes sure you finish the book because most people, when they buy a book, they don't finish it. Um, you also get a free coaching call. Right. So you'll get a coaching call with my team and that's going to be delivered to you uh, by either Nano or Rodrigo Torres. Rodrigo will be on the call later today. So if you're interested in doing that coaching call, I want you to reach out to Rodrigo. OK, so. Without further ado, I want to go ahead and jump into today's topic, which is going to be the sacred account versus indexed universal life insurance. Okay. Now, these are both big, uh, big terms, right? They're things that, um, you know, when we hear them, we're like, okay, what does this mean? If you're watching the sacred account is what's called high early cash value dividend paying whole life insurance, right? So it's a type of life insurance that has the savings vehicle attached to it. Um, it pays me dividends. I'm an owner in the company. So like, for example, let me just draw this out for you. When I save a dollar in a bank, okay, this goes into a bank account. Let's just kind of look at what happens, right? I put a dollar in a bank. Uh, I'm going to be earning usually 0.01% interest on my bank account. Okay, that's really where savings rates are at right now. They're terrible, okay? Now, the problem with this is if we use this thing called the rule of 72, if you take the number 72 and you divide it by the rate of return you're making on your money, it tells you about how long it takes for the money to double, okay? So this doubles every 720,000 years, okay? Like it's literally not even worth mentioning. That's how long it would take for, for my dollar to turn into $2 in the current banking system, right? Now, the problem lies in a couple of things. Number one, this dollar, when I put it in a bank, it's not actually there. Okay, it's being loaned out. It's being invested. It's called fractional reserve banking, FRB, okay? Which means they, the banks currently have a 0% reserve requirement on their deposits. Every single cent that I give them, they can loan out and invest, okay? Now, legislation was put in, I think in the, I want to say the late 90s, that basically allowed for banks to act like hedge funds. A bank can take the money that they have from depositors because banks never have their own money and they can trade aggressively. They can buy stocks, they can buy options, they can do foreign currency, they can do high risk loans, not to mention the gambit of you know, car loans and mortgages and credit cards that they're already loaning this money out on. Like realize when I give them my money, they are investing it and they're paying me 0.01% per year to use my money. Think about this. Like if you went to the bank right now and you said, I want to take a loan so I can invest in my business and they give you, okay, I'm going to give you a small business loan. What are they going to charge you? They're going to charge you what? Probably, you know, eight, maybe 10% interest. Okay. That's what they're going to charge me as a business owner or you as a business owner. If you want to take out a business loan, right? If you're like, Hey, I want to borrow money from you to buy a car. They're going to charge you probably, you know, three to maybe 6% interest to buy a vehicle, right? Now realize the money that I am borrowing from the bank is not their money. They're getting that from other people. That's not theirs, yet they're loaning it out like it's theirs. I'm paying them 8%, 10% interest, okay? The people they're taking it from, they're only paying 0.01% interest per year. How sweet of a deal is that for the bank? For me, it's not good, right? So we can see I'm getting ripped off. Like, A, like not only am I getting ripped off, I'm, my money is being put at risk, guys. Like, this is a risky thing. This is not like the, you know, it's easy and simple and they're all, no, no, banks are getting in trouble a lot. Like, if you, if you go look at like the history of banks on Wall Street, they literally, the fines and penalties that they pay, 
they just build it into their business model as cost of goods sold. Like, okay, as long as we can, as long as we can pay the fines and make profits still, we're going to break the law, right? Like that's the, that's the mentality that they have with banks and Wall Street, right? It might not be the mentality of the individual banker or front desk teller that you're talking to because they're at the bottom of the food chain, but the top execs, owners, and shareholders, that's what they do. That's what they think. And that's how they operate, right? So my money's at risk. I'm not making hardly anything. This 0.01% is taxable, right? How ridiculous is that? Like I'm making 0.01%. I believe if it's more than $10 a year, it's taxable. I'm going to pay taxes on this. This is not a great proposition. So I don't like saving money in banks for this reason. The money doesn't grow while it's in there, right? It's at risk. It's, you know, you'll hear, oh, it's FDIC insured. This is the big claim to fame. Oh, it's FDIC insured. Okay, well, the thing about FDIC insurance is right now they only have about a 2% coverage ratio on their liabilities, meaning they've only got enough money to cover about 2% of all deposits. And this is taxpayer funded. And banks have bail-ins, meaning if the bank messes up like they did in 2008, the government said, we're not gonna bail you out until you first bail in. This means they keep all their deposits so that they can stay solvent, so that they can stay afloat. They're going to take my money to fix their mistakes. I don't like this model, right? So naturally, I'm just kind of painting the picture. This is the problem I was trying to solve when I learned about the sacred account is where do I save my money? Okay, I don't want to put it in the bank. Cash goes down in value. I don't want to bury it in the backyard or put it in a safe, right? I didn't want to give it to Wall Street. I didn't at the time have enough to be doing real estate. So it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to just put this in a real estate asset. I didn't yet understand gold and silver. Gold and silver would be another place today that I do store a lot of my money, right? So I started to, to research where do the, where do the wealth, where do the wealthy save, right? Where do the wealthy save their money? And what I saw was, you know, uncanny, just the consistency from, from like the late 1800s onward. I saw Teddy Roosevelt put his money in a life insurance policy, a whole life insurance policy, like I'm going to describe to you today. Okay, JC Penny, James Cash Penny, he used a life insurance policy, a whole life insurance policy to be exact, to make payroll to keep JC Penny at the store open so that they could expand. Okay, Disney World. Okay, actually Disneyland. Walt Disney, he started Disneyland with a loan from his whole life insurance policy. McDonald's was started with a loan by Ray Kroc from his whole life insurance policy. Stanford University was started with a loan from a whole life insurance policy. Foster Farms whole life insurance policy, pampered chef, whole life insurance policy. I went all the way back even, and I saw that the Ro the Rockefellers even used this strategy. How come I'd never heard about this? Now, the kicker on top of this was when I started to research banks. Guess who is the number one owner and purchaser of this exact kind of whole life insurance? The largest banks in the United States. Okay, so as a bank, a bank has something called tier one capital. Okay, so you've got, you know, if I'm a if I'm a business, I have my reserves. And I've got tier one assets. Tier one assets are like my most prized reserves. This is the safest money out there. Right. So when you hear a bank talking about tier one assets, they're going to be doing things like cash. They're going to be doing things like treasuries. Okay, they're going to be doing things like life insurance. And they're going to be doing things like gold. These are all things a bank would consider a tier one asset. Right? Now, here's the deal. This is specifically the sacred account. This is not any other type of life insurance. This is high early cash value, dividend paying whole life insurance. You can Google B-O-L-I, bank owned life insurance, and you'll see exactly what I mean. It's, it's a staple. Like banks use this more than anybody else in the country, right? So when I, when I started learning that, I was like, okay, so I already don't like putting money in the bank. And when I put my money with the bank and they make profit, then one of the number one places they're going to put their profit is this exact kind of life insurance. Okay, that blew my mind. Okay, so here's how the sacred account works. This is why banks use it. So we talked about when I put money in a bank, what happens? Let's talk about what happens when I put money in a sacred account. Okay, 
So if I put that same dollar in a sacred account, it is going to grow at about a three to 5% annual rate, right? So three to 5%, right? So let's say we split the difference and it's 4%. Um, so at 4%, how many times does 0.01% go into four? It goes into that 400 times more. This is 400 times higher growth rate than my savings account. So already I'm winning on that, right? Like I put money in my life insurance policy, that dollar grows at a rate 400 times greater than the rate that I'm getting paid on a savings account, right? So that's already a win. Now, the other great thing, is it's guaranteed to grow. There are not many places where you can use the word guarantee. With all investments, there's always risk. There's always the chance for, for losing money. With the sacred account, it's not an investment. It's an insurance policy. So they can guarantee it, right? So it's got guaranteed growth. It's guaranteed against loss. But here's the thing. Like anyone can guarantee something. Like I can, I can be like, I guarantee it's going to rain tomorrow. Okay. My guarantee is only as good as me. Like how, how well do I know the weather? How correct will I be? Right. So I'm looking at, okay, when I hear guaranteed, right. Well, I look at, okay, well, who's making the guarantee because the, the, the credibility of the one making the guarantee is what makes me believe them. It's either going to be something that I think that they're capable of guaranteeing or it's great talk, but maybe they're not going to be able to. And I don't think they will with these life insurance companies. They're, 170 plus years old. And every single year since then, they have only ever made money and they have never lost money. Every single year for, you know, some of these are 100 years old. Some of them are 150. Some of them are 160. Some of them are 170 years old. Every single year since they started, they've never lost money and they've always made money. Right. Like that's that's so astounding to the point that it's boring. You do something every single year for 170 years in a row. And it's like, OK, I, I get it. you guys. You guys don't lose money and you only make money. I understand this. Right. So when I look at this and I hear, OK, this is guaranteed not to lose. And I see that they actually have made profit. Right. This is not like a bank saying we guarantee your money because the government will bail us out when we make bad decisions. No, no, no. The insurance company doesn't make bad decisions. They've stayed in business. They didn't need to get bailed out. They were able to continue growing through the Civil War, right? The Great Depression, the 1929 stock market crash, the recession in the 1950s, Black Monday, right? The tech bubble, the mortgage crisis, the pandemic of 2020, like every single one of those periods, they still made money and did not lose. You can't say that for banks. Like banks go out of business all the time. They guarantee your money and then they go out of business. Do they have deposit insurance? Sure, but that's just taxpayers bailing out banks. The insurance companies don't need taxpayer money. They don't need to be bailed out, right? Like when you look at this, uh, a great example. So there's a company called New York Life Insurance. They're one of the larger um, whole life insurance companies. They are larger than the, than the country Kuwait in terms of assets. Right. Like if they wanted to go buy the country of Kuwait, they could. Like that's that's how big they are. They could literally go buy a country right now. They have more in assets than the country of Kuwait. Right. So you look at okay, and 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 they've been around for 170 years. Right. Same thing with Guardian and Mass Mutual, these other companies that we we work with. Like these are solid companies. Okay. So these are some of the benefits of, of the sacred account and why I like the sacred account. I'm kind of painting why I use this first before we talk about the index universal life insurance. Guaranteed against growth, guaranteed against loss, no taxes. Remember we said when you put money in the bank, you're going to pay taxes even on your interest. The sacred account's not taxable. And the reason why is we take loans against it, right? So when you put money in an investment and that investment makes money, it makes a profit, and then you take that profit, that is a taxable event. That's that's a realized gain. You made money, and you actually took the money and put it in your pocket, right? The IRS can be like, hey, you made money, you owe us. With this, we don't take a distribution, or we don't pull the profit out. We borrow against. When we borrow against an asset, we do not get taxed. And the reason why is 
alone is not a game, right? Like if I, let's say, let's say I, let's say I, I buy this cup, right? I buy this cup that I have for $5. And then, you know, next month, the cup is worth $7. If I sell the cup for $7, I made a $2 profit and I will pay taxes on that $2. But if I go to somebody and say, Hey, this cup is worth seven bucks. I want to borrow $6 from you. And I'm going to pledge this cup as collateral. Meaning if I don't pay this back, you get to keep my cup and you make money because you have $7 and you only loaned me six. And they're going to say, that's a good deal here. Borrow my money. I can use the value of this cup without paying the taxes. Now I, I have put in five, I took out six and I don't have to pay the taxes because I did a loan. Now here's the thing. When I borrow against it, my cost of interest, if I do this correctly, is only going to be about one to 3%, right? Now, the great thing about borrowing is not only do I not pay taxes, but if I borrowed, think about this. If I borrowed against the cup, I still own the cup. Sure, I posted it as collateral. Sure, someone else is holding it till I pay the loan back, but this is still my cup. And at the end of that loan, they do have to give it back to me. What if the cup goes up in value during that time? They don't get to keep that value. That's my value. So if the cup becomes worth $9 and I pay my loan off, I'm making the $9 cup back. I'm getting that cup back. So in this circumstance, because we are borrowing against an asset, we're not selling it. And as it grows, we still get the growth. The, 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 long, the short story, I put a dollar in, that dollar is going to grow at 3 to 5%. I can borrow against it. My cost of interest is only 1% to 3%. I pay no taxes because it's a loan. And also that dollar still keeps making 3 to 5% while I use it, right? 3 to 5. Let's say I make 4 here and my interest cost is 2. Well, what's 4 minus 2? Positive 2%, right? I'm being paid 2% to borrow my own money, to do things like pay off consumer debt or make large purchases or invest for passive income. Right. Like these are all things that that happen with the sacred account. So just to give you, you know, a very clear example. This dollar goes in. And this entire dollar is making that three to five. Like I talked about three to five percent. While this is happening, I can borrow 70 to 90 percent of this dollar with an interest cost of one to three percent. Like I mentioned, right. And I can go use this to do whatever I want with it. There's no rules. Like you want to do smart things with it. So for me, initially, I was paying off debt, right? And I'll, I'll kind of talk about this in a second. I was paying off debt. Then I was doing things like, okay, I need a car. I need furniture. I need this. I would, I would actually make those purchases with my life insurance loan. Why? Because I want to make money on the purchase, not pay money to a bank. I would rather pay myself. I'd rather borrow from my policy and make payments back to myself than pay interest to a bank. Right, every dollar I put in here is going to grow forever. Okay, the reason why I get this growth is this is a, a mutual insurance company. Like Guardian is a mutual insurance company, Northwestern Mutual Insurance Company, Mass Mutual Insurance Company. What does mutual mean? Mutual means when I have a whole life insurance policy with them, I am literally treated like an equity owner in the company. They're, they're, that's where this comes from. This, this money is actually profit. Like they're a profitable business and then they share the profit with me as a policyholder. So even the interest I pay, I'm paying to my own company. Like that's good. Like it's like if I needed to go buy gas and I owned a gas station, I'm gonna have to buy gas anyways. I'm gonna go pay it to my own station, right? At least the profit comes back to me, okay? So the sacred account, this is a use it now concept. Right. So we're doing things like we're paying off debt. Okay. We're doing things like uh, large purchases. Okay. We're doing things like building up reserves, reserves that we can access and use today, not in 30 years today. Okay. We're doing things like investing. And the thing in common with all of this is it's happening now, right? Part of my story, guys, is I became a financial advisor at the age of 18. My mom was my first client. Okay, I sat down and helped her with her retirement planning. She had, uh, you know, a chunk of money that we put away and she was, you know, 58, 59 years old at the time. She invested with me for a year or two. And that was the whole thing. Mom, when you're 60, this is going to be, you know, you have a retirement, you can start taking it. 
Guys, at 60, she got diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. And six months later, she was dead. And so I watched the whole do it later, wait till you're 60, retire when you're older, not work with someone that mattered more than pretty much anyone else in my life at the time, right? Like with my own mother, right? So I looked at this at a young age, you know, 20, 21 years old. And I'm like, I don't want to wait till I'm 60. What if 60 doesn't happen? I don't want to defer my lifestyle, hoping and hoping and hoping. I want to do all this stuff now. Okay. Another story as a financial advisor, I would sit down with people, right? I would sit down with a family and I would be like, okay, good. Let's plan your retirement. Very similar conversation. You want to retire when you're 60, when you're 65, whatever that might be. And uh, they'd be like, great, let's do it. So we'd set up their IRAs. We'd set up their retirement accounts. And I would, I would leave that meeting knowing that they were still terrified of next week. How are we going to make the bills happen? Right. We don't have enough money saved. We are, we're struggling with debt. Right. What if we lose a job? What if, what if a pandemic occurs? Like these are all things that people were still concerned with, even though I told them, Hey, when you're 70 years old, you're going to be fine. They're like, yeah, but right now I'm 43. I'm worried about the next five years, like 70 years old. That's not even real for most people. They're like, how do I build wealth now? How do I get solvent now? How do I survive now? So we need strategies that handle now not strategies that handle something that may or may not happen 40 years from now. Whether it's 40 years or 20 years, like wh why, would I, why would I give up you know, succeeding now for the possibility of, po of maybe being successful in 20 years, right? So that's the sacred account concept. Now I wanna talk about the, the index universal life insurance next. So there's two different types of uh, insurance at a very basic level. Um, there is what's called term insurance, And there is what's called permanent insurance. Okay. Term insurance is like car insurance. It's temporary. Okay. Permanent is exactly this. It's, it's going to last your whole life. So this usually covers you until, with our accounts, 121 years old. And if you live till 121, they pay you anyways, right? So you're going to get paid no matter what. Term usually covers you anywhere from, from one year to maybe 30 years. It's like car insurance. Like if I, if I have a car insurance policy, generally that's one year worth of coverage. I have to renew it after. If I pay them and don't get in a wreck, I don't get anything back. It just, I, didn't, I didn't get in a car wreck. I just paid for the coverage. Term insurance is the same way. Permanent insurance it's going to pay out no matter what, even, even if I live till 121, they're, they're just going to pay out the death benefit. Okay. And it has cash value. Cash value is a savings account that builds up. And if I structure this correctly, I can actually turn this into my own banking system. And that's the sacred account concept, right? So with a permanent uh, policy, my cash value usually pays for the entire cost to the policy. If I wanted to by year seven, meaning after seven years, my, my policy is free, right? Like if, if I set this up and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna pay in for seven years and at the seven year marker, my cash value is higher than my contributions. And I'm like, I don't wanna put any more money into this ever again. I still get the death benefit. I still have the cash value. I can still take loans against it and it's free. And I actually made more money than my premiums costed. It was a profitable thing for me. With this, it's a total loss. It's either a total total loss if I don't use it and if I do use it, you know, it's a total loss in that sense as well, right? I, like, I'm not there. I can't have that money. It doesn't help. It's not for me. It's for whoever I left behind, okay? So the, the index universal life insurance works like this. If I were to put a dollar into it, and there are many ways to design this, right? So I'm going to tell you what I usually see. If I put a dollar into it, I'm going to have in my, in my net surrender value, is what this is called. If I were to cancel and pull the money out today, my net surrender value is usually going to be oftentimes zero the first year. Okay. Versus on a whole life insurance policy, a sacred account, my net surrender value is usually going to be 70 to 90 cents in the first year. Right. Why would this be important? I can't take a loan against zero. Right. Like I can't borrow against the number is zero. There's nothing there to take a loan against. On this side with the whole life, 
right? This is 70 to 90%. I can take a loan against that. I can pay off debt. I can invest. I can do all sorts of things with it. Now, this dollar is growing at about 3 to 5%. Either way, that's the kicker. Index universal life insurance does not grow that much more than whole life insurance. When you look at the actual net surrender values on in-force illustrations, maybe you're going to get six, maybe you're going to get 7%, but generally it's about the same as a whole life policy. So you've got the same, about the same return, okay? You've got a lot less money to use up front. And I can't borrow against those smaller numbers. This, so the, the, the index universal life, we'll just call this IUL is a later plan, right? Meaning I can't use this now. It's not designed for me to borrow against today in most cases. The whole life, we'll call this a sacred account. This is a now strategy. I'm gonna use it now, okay? Now, here's why this is zero. The first year, all of the money that you put into it goes to commissions and fees. Like the agent that sold this, makes if they sell you know a, a ten thousand uh, dollar annual premium they're gonna make most of that in commissions and fees right like they're they're gonna get a lot of this especially here's here's the difference here the term and the the IUL the insurance because this is life insurance the insurance is called annually renewable term when I sell annually renewable term oftentimes the commission on this will be a hundred to 130% of the first year premium. This isn't even IUL. Like this is this is just annually renewable term. Now, IUL uses annually renewable term, meaning the life insurance component is term insurance. The cost increases every single year, right? But if I, as a life insurance agent, just sold someone annually renewable term, the company that I sell with is generally speaking going to pay me one, 100 to 130% commission on the first year premium, meaning they might even pay me more money than they make. Why? Because they know next year the premium is going to go up and the year after the premium is going to go up and they're going to recover their costs. So this is how annually renewable term works is every single year, your cost goes up. Your premium goes up. On an index universal life insurance policy, you've got some money that covers the term insurance. You've got some money that goes into cash value. But when the premiums come up, which they do and will every single year, the money comes out of cash value. Right? I'm gonna have, I'm gonna either have a less money going to cash value out of my monthly contribution, or my monthly contribution will be the same, and I'm gonna have less money in my cash value because it pulls out and starts liquidating itself. Right? Neither of these are great. These are not great options. Right? So, so this is one of the things that I don't personally like about annually or about a, a sorry about index universal life insurance. Um, is that I can't use it today. It does have a term insurance uh, base. That's the type of, of coverage it is versus with the sacred account is whole life insurance, right? Whole life is a fixed cost. It's something that's never going to go up in, in price. I'm going to have that locked in for the rest of my life. Think of it like a mortgage. Like if I do a mortgage, my mortgage is going to be the same payment for the next 30 years. It's not going to go up, right? If I have a fixed rate conventional mortgage versus renting, if I rent every single year, my rent's going to go up and that cost has to come from somewhere, right? And so I'm either going to have to earn more income or it's going to come out of my savings. No different than a universal life policy. I'm renting the insurance company coverage every single year. The rent goes up, the coverage goes up. I either need to pay that through contributions or it's going to come out of my cash value, which is my savings. That doesn't happen with whole life. Right now, the other problem that I have with with um, universal life is that they say it's guaranteed against loss. OK, so generally speaking, like the cash value, and this is where they're going to tout it, is they're going to say, hey, this is going to be invested on a stock market index. Meaning it's going to copy the stock market to a degree without actually being in the stock market. So you can't lose. Right. So if the market goes up, you might get a percentage of that upside. OK, so percentage of upside. Okay, if the market goes down, you get 0%, meaning you never lose money. They call this a floor. Okay, now here's the issue. A lot of times they'll say the floor is 0%. Agents will think, oh, 0% means no loss, right? 0% doesn't mean no loss. 0% just means your account was credited with zero. 
Okay, it does not mean you didn't lose money. What I'm saying here is there's still fees. If I have a 0% year and I have, you know, insurances have things called riders, right? You can add riders on an insurance policy. Riders are like bells, they're features. I can add, you know, these little different things on there, but there's always going to be a fee. So having an index has a rider, that rider has an annual cost. Having a non-lapse guarantee has a cost. Like all these different things have a cost. So I might've been credited with zero, but I still might have fees of 2% that year. Where are those fees going to come from? My cash value. Zero minus 2% in fees means my cash value went down by 2%. I still lost money. That's not zero, that's negative two, right? So I might lose less, but I'm not getting, losing nothing. It might not be as bad as being in the stock market, but in a down year, I'm still not losing. I'm still not guaranteed against loss. With whole life, it is guaranteed against loss. You cannot lose money. There aren't these fees coming out in a negative year. Right. So when I look at savings, like an IUL is not a savings account. Right. So whole life, this equals alternative savings account. I can be my own bank. I'm going to borrow against this thing. I'm going to use it for all the things I would want to do in my life, including saving money. The IUL is not like that, right? It's a later plan. This is more like an alternative to a Roth IRA. Okay, and when I think about this, a Roth IRA, it's, it's something I'm going to use down the road when I'm 60. It's, it's the thing I talked about at the very beginning of this course. 60 years old, I put enough money into it, it grew. Now I'm going to start taking money out. Right off the bat, that's not the plan for me. Okay, I want to be able to be my own bank. I need to be able to take a loan tomorrow, not, not in 10 years. Okay, I need to know that my savings are going to be there. They're not going to be you know, eroded by increasing insurance costs. Or when I have a down year, there's not going to be these fees still coming out that take my cash value down. I don't want that. I want to make sure that my money is growing no matter what just like if I put it in a bank. And I can't achieve, I cannot achieve that with index universal life insurance. It's a totally different purpose and it's a totally different tool. And it's something I don't preach for. I don't tell people like, hey, wait till you're 60. If we can build wealth in the next five, 10, 15 years, why not? Let's do it. There's no reason to wait, okay? So the other problem with an indexed universal life policy that you don't see with a whole life is if you fast forward down the road, Let's say, you know, when you're 70 years old, we'll just give you both scenario here. 70 years old, we have the IUL and we have the sacred account, okay? So at 70 years old, you still have annually renewable term insurance. The cost of those renewals when you're 70 are astounding. We're talking thousands of dollars per month for your insurance premiums. You're not going to be contributing thousands of dollars per month. So that means it's going to come out of your cash value. So that cost has to be paid. It's going to come out of your cash value. You're taking thousands of dollars per month in losses now. Okay. The only way to fix that is by reducing the amount of coverage someone has. Right. So if we reduce, you know, let's say the, the annual renewal, annually renewable term insurance, let's say I started my policy with, you know, $500,000 worth of coverage. Well, now I'm 70 and that $500,000 worth of coverage costs me three grand a month. I can't afford to keep that. So it's either going to drain my cash value and completely liquidate it where I have no more cash value. My policy goes into a lap status because I can't afford to make a $3,000 a month premium. Or I've got to say, hey, I can't afford half a million dollars in death benefit. We're going to have to lower it. We're going to have to drop it down to 100000 Now I paid for something for the last 40 years that I'm not even going to get to use because the cost went up. This doesn't happen with the sacred account with whole life. By the time I'm 70, this is what's known as paid up. No premiums are due. The, the, because the, the cost, like the dividends pay for the, the, the insurance costs themselves, right? The, the policy is paid up. I don't need to reduce my death benefit. My death benefit is going to be the same. There's nothing liquidating my cash value. My cash value is never going to go down. This is what's known as paid up. So just looking at the comparison, when I'm 70 and I start saying, okay, I'm going to withdraw income from my index universal life now. 
okay, well, I'm going to start pulling my income out. And at the same time, I'm going to have these giant insurance costs coming out, or I'm going to have to reduce my coverage down. Right. If I reduce my coverage down, like now I'm getting less death benefit, I'm actually giving something up in order to reduce the cost. With the sacred account, I'm giving nothing up. My, my coverage is going to be growing. Actually, the number, the amount of death benefit that I have on a whole life insurance policy will go up in almost every year. Like that's a function of the life insurance policy itself. So it's not going to go down. I don't need to lower it. I don't have an increased insurance cost. Whole life insurance is a fixed cost, like with a mortgage. The policy pays internally for its own expenses. I don't need to contribute anything and it's never going to drop. My death benefit will be fine. My cash value will be fine. Neither of those things have to be compromised in order for me to be able to use this, right? So I would rather have a paid up policy than an expensive annually renewable term policy that I've got to reduce my coverage on, okay? Now you can get, like I said, a non-lapse rider. This is basically a rider that says, hey, we guarantee the policy won't lapse you know, for within a certain period of time. But again, this is another fee. If I have a 0% year and I'm paying for another fee on another, another rider, that loss on my 0% year becomes even bigger. Okay, so this, this is such a different concept. And I, and I hit this because it's confusing for most people. It's actually very simple. This one, IUL, long-term strategy, much more moving parts involved. Riskier, you've got more costs, you've got more variables. Variable, variables, meaning things that can change. The, the, when, when you sign up, like for example, they can say, we're going to give you, you know, um, 100% of market participation with a 10% cap. And then we have a 0% floor. So whatever the S&P 500 does, whatever the stock market does, you're going to get 100% of this credited to your account up to 10%. Okay. And you'd be like 10%. That's great. Well, they can lower this cap anytime. There's, this is not contractually obligated. They can bait you in at 10. And then a couple of years into it, be like, Hey, sorry. 10% um, cap doesn't make sense anymore. This is now seven, right? That's a variable. That's something I don't control that can change, right? The participation rate, this can also change, right? They might say, Hey, we can't afford to do hundred percent. We can only do 70 now. Okay, that's another variable. The 0% floor, well, we have fees. The fees are another variable. That's another thing that I don't control. Right, so I can go into it thinking it's gonna be this way. I'm gonna put money into it for 20, 30 years and then pull out my retirement income and it's gonna be great. And this thing says, I'm gonna get you know 100% of what the market does. And in the last 20 years, the market did 12% a year and that's amazing. So I'm gonna get 10%. Yeah, until they change the cap until they change your participation rate, until you have 0% years where the fees come out, that's not going to be illustrated, right? Until your, your annually renewable term insurance costs increase, right? These are all things that you don't control. They all can change. I don't want this. Even in my own investments, I don't want this. I like doing like seller finance and private lending on real estate because it can't change. That, that house is that house, the interest rate that I charge the person that lives there is the interest rate. There's nothing that can change that. It's agreed upon. I want stability. Like for me, when it comes to building wealth, I have to be able to, to have stability, right? Because I, like, if I have nothing stable, I don't have power. I can't push off anything. Like think about the idea of, 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 of shooting a cannon from a canoe. What's going to happen? You're going to fire it and it's going to fly backwards and you're going to get no momentum. The cannon's not going to shoot very far. That's what variability does with finances. Right. When I have, okay, I'm, 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 I'm relying my, with my retirement upon this thing and then it can change. It's not going to come out the way I expected it to. Now I want to clarify, does this mean IUL is bad? Does it mean this is a bad product? No, it's not a bad product, right? With financial products, there's no such thing as bad, right? They're, 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 they're inanimate objects and they're amoral. They don't, they don't have like, oh, we do good things and bad. It's a, it's a, it's, a, it's an objective thing. Like you can use it for whatever. It's like saying, you know, is this pen bad? Well, if I stab someone in the eye, you might say pens are bad. Okay, no, it's it's a pen. I can also write with it, right? So it comes down to the user. It's not about a product. It's not about the people, you know, that are selling it. Like the IUL, like when you look at a lot of these guys that sell IUL, they don't know this stuff. They're getting taught, you know, the exact pitch they need to be taught to sell IUL. They're not being told there are other alternatives out there. They're not being told you could be doing the sacred account. 
their teams that they have and their agencies that they have don't get paid to sell sacred accounts. Financially, they've got no incentive to ever be taught about this, right? So it's almost not even their fault in that sense because it's like, okay, if I don't know about something and nobody's ever willing to teach me because the, the people that are teaching it don't make money on it, it's kind of like with big pharma, right? Think about it like this. Like, are they ever going to have incentive to teach you how to be healthy? No, the entire pandemic, you never once heard, hey, make sure you drink enough water. Hey, make sure you're exercising. Make sure you eat enough fiber. Make sure you're getting vegetables. No, it was like, go buy our, our pills and our vaccines and, and all this stuff that we make money on. Right? Like, what about just take care of myself? They're health authorities, right? Same thing with the insurance. Like, they're, they're not going to be like, hey, there's other things you could do. It's the same thing as with Wall Street. They're not going to be like, hey, did you know instead of a Roth IRA or a mutual fund, you could be doing the sacred account, right? So I wanted to share this lesson. I'm going to open this up for some questions before we wrap things up today. I wanted to share this lesson today, A, to give you some education on Index Universal Life, on the sacred account. Um, I've been in the insurance industry since I was 18 years old. I'm now 30. Um, I've looked at these things through and through for well over a decade now. Um, and, and for me, I would never own an Index Universal Life Insurance policy. And it's not even because it's bad. It's because it doesn't fit the purpose I'm using it for. I can't take loans against it right now. I can't pay off consumer debt with it right now. I can't borrow against it to invest right now. I've got to wait. And, and, and the longer I wait, for me, that equals opportunity cost. I don't, it's like, like if I was doing the waiting game and, and it was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to wait till I'm 60, like everyone else in the world does. Like, sure. Maybe I'm going to look at this as an option to avoid putting money with Wall Street. Right. But that's not what I'm doing. And that's not what I have to do. And so because of that, you know, it's not something that I'm going to recommend other people do. Okay. So I want to open this up for questions. I do, I do want to make you guys aware we have Rodrigo Torres on the call today. So if you're listening to this, um, Rod is going to reach out to you. Um, you can also send him a message. Rod, if you could just get, get in touch with some of the people in the comments on the chat, just send a couple messages out, connect. Um, if you get a message from Rod, he's probably connecting with you just to get your phone number and see if you'd like to set up a call after. Um, and then again, if you don't have a copy of my book yet, okay, I want to make sure you do get this. There's an entire chapter on um, index, or sorry, on universal life insurance. There's an entire chapter on the sacred account. There's more than an entire chapter on the sacred account. Um, but if you go to jerryfetta.com forward slash B2F promo, okay, jerryfetta.com forward slash B2F promo, you can get a free copy of the book. You cover your shipping. We will give you a free coaching call. We'll give you a course supervisor that makes sure you get through the book and you'll be able to actually learn and apply. Like not only what we talked about today, but much more beyond that. So um, go to this link, jerryfetta.com forward slash B2F promo, grab that copy. Um, and again, if you get a message from Rodrigo, that is who he is. And um, that's, that's why he's connecting with you. We have a lot of good uh, questions here. So let me go ahead and answer some questions here that we have in Zoom. Um, first one is Jorge Torres. Um, so I'm going to bring Jorge on and see if we can go live and answer Jorge's question. So Jorge, I just gave you the option to unmute your mic. Um, so that way we can uh, actually chat live and answer your question here. All right, so I think we're live with Jorge. How are uh, you today? Pretty good. How are you? I'm good. What is your question? Yeah, my question is, um, well, actually, actually, I I, uh, I posted uh, uh, two questions. One question is, uh, when when a bank when the bank buys uh, life insurance, uh, who's the beneficiary when, when when they're buying this life insurance? That's a really good question. So um, the beneficiary is typically going to be a key employee of the bank. So they'll often insure their exec, or sorry, the insured will often be a key employee of the bank. The beneficiary will often be the bank itself. Sometimes the bank will split the death benefit with maybe the, the family or the survivors of the person they insured, um, depending on if it's like an executive compensation type policy or not. If it's just straight for the benefit of the bank, then generally the bank itself will be the beneficiary. Okay, but, but it's based on, on, on somebody eventually dying, right? Because the bank will continue living, but, but this one person, uh, when the person dies, that's, that's when they get uh, the money. 
That's correct. Yep. And then they'll borrow against that the entire time, even while that person is living. I see. And, and the second question, when, when you talk about net surrendered value, is that what they, they sometimes call the insurance, the cash value? Is that the same thing you were referring to? Yeah, exactly. And I, and I usually call it the cash value. Um, the reason I called it the net surrender value today specifically is because on an IUL, you actually have two values. You have your net surrender value, and then you have your accumulation value. Okay, so your accumulation value is basically completely arbitrary. They're saying, based on the projected growth, here's what we think the policy will be worth in the future. This is like a pro forma. Um, a pro forma, you know, if you're in, in the real estate world, it's a future projection. It's not actually guaranteed. It's not true. It's not something we can base anything off. The net sur surrender value, this is the actual cash value. Um, the reason why I said net surrender instead of cash value is with an IUL, you have what's called a surrender charge. So let's say that I put um, you know, money into an IUL and in year three, I'm like, I don't want this anymore, right? There's going to be a fee for me to take my money out. And that fee might be six or 7% that I'm going to pay in order to exit. And so I'm only going to get the net value after the surrender is paid. And that's why we would not call this generally the same as cash value, because on a whole life policy, you don't have that fee. If I wanted to cancel tomorrow, I can pull 100% of my cash value out right now, and there's not that fee included. Um, versus on the IUL, you pay a surrender charge, and you don't actually get the accumulation value. Um, so that's that's the answer on the why behind that. Uh, but that's a good question that, that Jorge asked there. All right, so... Um, Someone asked, you say high yield, et cetera, so fast I can't write it down. What is it called? Okay, so the whole life policy, this is called high early cash value dividend paying whole life insurance. And this is this is why we call it the sacred account. That's way too many syllables, but that's what it's called. Um, sometimes you'll hear it you know, called the infinite banking concept or cash flow banking. Um, sometimes, you know, you might even just like in illustrations, you'll just see HECV, H-E-C-V, high early cash value. Heck v. Um, we just call it the sacred account just because it's it's too much to be like high early cash value, dividend paying whole life insurance. And that's why I say it fast. I've, I've been saying it for so many years, but we just call it the sacred account just to avoid all of that nonsense. Um, okay, we have a question from Ryan Sherwood. Let me bring Ryan on live here and answer his question. All right, so we are live here with Ryan. Ryan, how are you doing today? Good, good. Yeah, I just had a question on, uh, you know, comparing this, you know, as far as taking a loan out, like securities based lending, you know, some of the firms allow you to uh, take a loan against your securities. Yes, yeah, so securities based lending, for those of you that, that may not know what that is, if you own a stock or you own, you know, a fund of some sort, sometimes you can get a line of credit and borrow against them. Um, the main difference on like borrowing from a life insurance policy is number one, you're going to be able to borrow a lot higher value. So on a securities based loan, oftentimes you'll only be able to borrow maybe 40 to maybe 70% of the value um, on a whole life insurance policy. You're going to be able to borrow, you know, 90, 95% on the upside, um, you know, de depending on who you're doing the loan with. The other one is with securities based lending, securities can go up and down and investment value can change. And so you can have in, an event called a margin call where I borrowed, when I borrowed, my shares were worth 100. And now all of a sudden they're only worth 70. And so I've borrowed, my loan still is based on $100 a share, but my actual shares are only worth 70. And now I've got a deficit. And so the securities based lenders are going to sell my shares at a loss in order to recuperate their money. And so that's a risk with securities based lending. With whole life insurance, that doesn't exist. They're, it can't lose. So there's no such thing as a margin call. I also, with a whole life policy, never have to pay the loan back if I don't want to, because there's a death benefit. That death benefit will pay off any outstanding loans when I die. So I don't condone that. I think you should always pay yourself back. But with a securities-based loan, you have to. There's not an option not to. You have that option with a whole life. Um, and then also the interest is different. With a whole life policy, it's interest only paid once per year. Um, with the securities-based loan, generally, that's going to be monthly interest you've got to pay as well. So those are some of the main differences. Um, and so that's that's something that, um, you know, if you're doing securities-based lending, for sure, you can do some similar things, but there will definitely be some um, primary differences versus doing a whole life policy. 
Okay, Nicholas has a question. Let me bring Nicholas on and we'll answer his question here. Really good questions today, guys. All right, hey, we're live up? with Nicholas. How are you today? I'm doing great, yourself? Hey, I'm doing good. What is your question? Uh, my question was on the repayment of the loan. Is it important to, or how important is it to accelerate those payments if possible? I mean, does it have like a, a positive effect uh, in terms of returns uh, with the, uh, the, the interest rates on the loan? Yeah, it definitely does. So with a whole life policy, when I'm taking a policy loan, um, I always do want to pay myself back. So my rule is if I'm paying off debt, whatever the, the, like if I paid off, let's say a car loan and it was a $400 a month car payment, that old payment that I used to make on the car loan, I'm always going to pay myself back with it, right? So I'm going to pay my policy loan off with that same number. Um, if I pay off, you know, if, let's say if I do an investment, I, I pull out $50,000, I do an investment, it's paying me five, $600 a month. That income, I'm going to pay all that income towards my policy loan, right? What that does is it obviously, um, it reduces my interest cost because a, a life insurance policy loan is a line of credit. If I pay the loan down, then my interest is being calculated off of a smaller number every single time I make that payment. And so it actually reduces my total interest cost, which gives me a better profit spread between my earning rate and my interest rate for borrowing that I've got to pay. Right. So that's the first thing. The second thing is when I pay back a policy loan, it is the same function as saving money in a savings account. And the reason being, if I put if I put it back into the policy loan, I can pull it right back out again. Right. Versus if I put it in a bank, I can pull it right back out again. It's the same function. I still have full control and full access over it. So um, I always would say service your loans, pay them down early. You don't have to like try and pay them off like like, you know, aggressively, like if it was a credit card. Definitely you can if you want to, but at the very minimum, if you paid off debt, whatever the old payment was gets paid back. If you invested, whatever the, the income was, I would get, get paid back on. And then if it's like a purchase, like I buy a car or, you know, like I self-financed my couch just because I could. Um, I put myself on a five-year term and say, hey, I'm going to pay my policy loan back over the next five years. Here's my monthly payment. Very similar to like what a bank would do. Uh, oh, Nicholas, Nicholas had a question on IOL. Sounds like a Wall Street financial product. Was it created in the boardroom? Yeah, so it definitely is a Wall Street financial product. Um, you know, in the 1970s and 80s, it was just called universal life insurance. Um, that went to crap. A bunch of people lost money. Um, the uh, next one after that was called variable universal life insurance, which actually had mutual funds plus the annually renewable term. In 2008, that one went to crap. People lost a bunch of money. So then they were like, okay, well, what, what can we sell next? They came up with the index universal life insurance policy. So if you're an agent or you've been an agent and you have paid attention to this stuff, you will notice IUL didn't really get popular until about 2008, 2009, 2010 in that area, right? Now, the first one ever created was created, I think, in 1999 by Transamerica, but nobody else used them until after the 08 crisis. And it's because the insurance agents needed something to sell that wasn't going to be with Wall Street. They didn't want the losses. They didn't want to have to keep you know, talking to their clients and saying, hey, we lost your money again. Um, so that's, that's where that came from. Um, let's see here. We have a question from Leslie Davis. Let's see if we can bring Leslie on here. All right, let's see if we have less. We, I think we're live now with Leslie. How are you today, Leslie? Pretty good. Uh, I'm curious about the, the ability to uh, invest in a sacred account, life, the whole life, for a relative versus myself, given my age and everything, and how that might work. Yes, so this is a very common and good question. With a whole life policy, you're going to have three different, three different roles. You're going to have the owner. You're going to have the insured and you're going to have the beneficiary. These do not all have to be the same person. So um, let's say in Leslie's case, we could have Leslie as the owner. It's his policy. He's going to fund it. He could have, let's say his, um, you know, child, let's say if he has a, a child, maybe an adult child. So he could have one of his children as the insured. And then he could have himself as the beneficiary, 
right? And what this does is it means that they're the insured if they pass away, the death benefit pays out to you, but you're also the owner. So you can borrow against the policy and do all of these things now and not have to worry about whether or not it's your policy. Um, if you wanted to, you could even say, okay, we're going to make the beneficiary um, half Leslie and half grandchildren, right? And that way, you know, that, that death benefit helps, you know, create some legacy and different things. So there's a lot of flexibility. Leslie, I would recommend um, getting in touch with Rodrigo, um, Rodrigo Torres. If you can reach out to Leslie Rodrigo and just set up a call with them and answer some of these questions more in depth with them. Um, and, and that'll kind of help talk through, you know, how this may or may not work for his situation individually. Okay, I think a few more questions I see. Let me go ahead and pull these up here. Uh, Caleb says, I'm watching this from a tractor. That is awesome. Uh, I've never heard that one before, but that's that's phenomenal. Um, good to see everyone. Good to see you. Uh, Avery said, that's why Rockefeller didn't trust banks. Yeah, Rockefeller didn't trust banks. And also he owned one, um, like he owned an actual bank. What sets the interest rate three to five with the insurance company? Uh, we have a question from Jamie uh, D'Onofrio. Let me bring Jamie on here. All right, let's see if we can go live with Jamie and answer Jamie's question. All right, Jamie may not have a microphone. So I'll go ahead and read Jamie's question. Um, what sets the interest rate three to 5% with the insurance company? Is it based on how the plan is set up or does it have to do with your health, age, individual company? Um, so basically all insurance companies are going to have their own rates, regardless of age, health, everyone's going to have that rate. Some of them will lower the rate if you've had a policy with them longer. So generally speaking, you're going to see the gross rate at about five to 6%. We say three to five because we're telling you pay your loans back early. Uh, when you pay your loan back early, it reduces your interest cost. And so your net actual cost is closer to, you know, one to 3% on the interest rate. As far as the earned rate, the three to 5%, that is based on performance. So each company has their own base guarantee rate that they're going to credit you as interest earned on your cash value. Then they also have a dividend and that dividend is literally them sharing their profit with you. So when they're profitable, you're going to get more of that dividend. Okay. And so um, that's, that's going to be dependent on the, on the company. The design of the policy, all of that is very, very custom to each person and each policy. So, um, Jamie, what I would recommend if you're not yet a client, and, and if you are, that's totally fine. If you're not yet, I would connect with Rod. Um, and either way, you could connect with Rod and, and get more of those questions answered specifically. Um, and that way, he can kind of go over the design and, and how that might look for you. All right, we have a couple more questions here. Um, so the loan rate, Jamie asked again, so I kind of answered this one already, the loan rate, pay your loans down early. Also, if you have cash value of more than 50,000, we can get you loan rates that are lower. Um, if you have a policy, I believe longer than 10 years with certain carriers, they'll drop your loan rates as well. So again, those are all things we work with our clients on. It's very tailored to the policy design. Um, so again, get, get in touch with Ron for sure on that. Uh, Nick says IULs are a crapshoot. Um, he didn't, I, I didn't say it, Nick did. Um, good to see you, Lawrence. Stephanie asks, does age or health matter when it comes to whole life? Yes. So anytime you're dealing with life insurance, age and health does matter. Um, it matters less than you would think on a whole life policy on term insurance. It matters a lot more. Like you'll see a very significant difference between someone that gets a different age or health class rating. Um, on a whole life, because it is, you know, based on the, the dividend growth and all these different factors, it's not as pronounced, but it does definitely make an impact. The younger and healthier, healthier you are, the better the performance on a policy is going to be. But that doesn't mean if you're older or you have a health issue not to do a policy, because you still might be able to get pretty much the same thing, just slightly different because of those, those, um, those different circumstances. Um, Caleb says, just finished the process. I'm uh, just waiting on Guardian to fund my account out of my normal account. Super excited to start borrowing for myself. That's awesome, Caleb. So Caleb set up an account with our team. He is saying he's just now getting through the process. Um, you know, there's financial and also medical underwriting that someone goes through. Uh, we are building your own bank. So that's a process in and of itself. So Caleb's almost done with that and about to start being able to be his own bank. 
Good. And then uh, Rod put his calendar link in the comments. So guys, if you're watching and you would like to set up a free call with Rodrigo, um, definitely do that. Again, the book is jerryfeta.com forward slash B2F promo. And I put that in the chat. Um, should I bring this up to my insurance agent to see if she's ever heard about it? The tractor pays cash so I can add some unplanned PUAs. Um, I'm not quite sure what Caleb's asking. Let me bring Caleb on live just to clarify his question here. All right, Caleb, if you're able, I'm going to see if you can uh, mic up here and we can go over your question on, on your um, current insurance agent. Hey, Caleb, how are you? Good. How are you? Can you hear me? I can. Yeah. You hear me okay as well? Yes, I do. Awesome. I so you have a question about your current insurance right agent. Now. Well, I just, I was thinking out loud as I'll just put it in the chat. And this is the first time enjoying one of your uh, classes here. And um, I just wondered if maybe my insurance adjuster that sold me other life insurance, uh, maybe she already knows about all this, or maybe she doesn't. She's She's been an insurance adjuster of mine for years as far as car insurance, life insurance, house insurance. And and after paying her for all the other life insurance policies she sold me, I'm wondering why she's duped me. Yes, so that question comes up a lot. Um, so the first thing to look at is, is um, you know, with, with insurance agents, there's what's known as a captive agent. And then there's also what's known as an independent agent. So if somebody works for State Farm or Allstate or whoever, they can't sell other companies generally. They have to sell State Farm. And so it's not even in that case, like if it's a State Farm agent, they didn't even dupe you. It's they work at Ford and it can only sell Ford. That's the dealership they're at. They work at State Farm. They can only sell State State Farm. Um, now the other ones, if they are independent, um, just to give you the numbers, only 6% of, of whole life insurance policies are designed where um, you know cash value loans are actually happening. So that's of all life insurance policies, about 1%. So it's not even just your agent. It's literally 99% of insurance policies sold aren't designed this way. Um, and that's an industry-wide issue. So if I were to guess, I would say that your agent probably has never even seen this or heard of it. Um, if you were to show it to the, to the agent, they probably would, you know, they'd be confused. They'd be like, I don't know what this is. Is this legal? They'd have a lot of questions, right? And it would probably be something where they didn't know. And if, if, if they did know, they probably aren't allowed to sell it or offer it. Um, so usually I, I cut them some slack. Obviously, you don't have to keep doing business with them on life insurance. You've got the, the guardian account now. Um, but usually there's not bad intentions. Sometimes there are. And in those cases, if the agent works for a company that can design it, they know about it. They know how they could design it, but because they let they make less money, they're not going to. Um, and that's that's you know a, a special case of scumbag, if you ask me. But that's not most agents. Avery asked, "What years the dividend kick in? Three years after being issued? So it's year two. So the first year obviously is the guarantee. The second year, I think the end of the second year, the dividend gets credited. Um, and so that's going to be you know the the yeah, end of second year based on your anniversary date is what I believe that that is, Avery." All right, Jorge has a question. So if you can get a car loan for 2%, but your life insurance loan rate is five, would you still get the life insurance loan? Yes, and I'll tell you why. So um, let's say that I am going to buy a car for $30,000. And I'm going to borrow money, right? So I could borrow money at zero, or I could borrow, so there's zero, I can go in, in negatives where I'm paying interest. I could borrow at negative one, negative two, negative three, or I could borrow at a positive where I actually make money on a loan. So when I borrow at a negative rate where I'm paying money, even if it's only 2%, so I'm paying 2% to the bank, I'm still paying interest. If I borrow against my life insurance policy, my net effective interest cost is one to 3%, meaning this is about what I'm gonna pay. Right. So let's say we we average this in the middle. It's negative two. I'm going to pay 2%, but my money that I borrowed is still growing at three to five. Right. And let's split the difference and call this four. Okay. So my money is growing at four. It costs me two. I'm making positive 2%. So that loan actually doesn't cost me anything on a net basis. Like at the end of the day, I'm still making profit to borrow. Um, so for me, I would much rather do that than pay 2% to a bank that actually does cost me 2%. I'm not making profit on a bank loan. They are. 
right? So that's why I would still do the policy loan. Um, you know, even if I could get a, you know, a, a cheap interest rate from a bank, just because the bank still costs me something, right? Okay, good. That's all the questions that I see on Zoom. Let me check Facebook one, one more time here before we uh, wrap things up. Um, and again, guys, thanks for watching. I appreciate everyone tuning in today on Facebook. Good to see everyone. Andrew, good to see you. Sean, good to see you. Um, Lawrence, good to see you. Justin, good to see you. Justin says, I'm extremely grateful for my sacred account. Awesome. We're so glad you're winning with it. I was just texting Justin today about using his, his sacred account for different, um, different vehicle purchase strategies. Andrew Davis says, I'm so glad I found out about this concept and enjoy my sacred account very much. I paid off my car loan with my sacred account and have my six months reserves in there. And I'm building up my cash value to make my first investment. That is so awesome. Um, yeah. And that's, that's guys, these are, these are the kind of stories we hear every day from clients that have sacred accounts. You know, it's one of those things that it's time tested. It's been around forever. Um, so again, if you, before we sign out, if you do not have a copy of my book, I do need to plug this one more time. Go to jerryfetta.com forward slash B2F promo. I'll go ahead and type this again. It's jerryfeta.com forward slash B2F promo. You can get a copy of the book. Um, again, that will come with a coaching call. That will come with a course supervisor to get you through the book. Um, otherwise, we will be tuning off for today. Um, thank you guys all for watching. We'll be back again next Saturday, 1 p.m. same time. Also, do not miss Nano's uh, call on Monday. Nano Aquino on my team is doing a call um, Monday, 4 p.m. Eastern time on our Facebook page. Um, he's going through the book, Liar's Poker, right? We talked about Wall Street. Great book if you want to know what actually goes on there, okay? So that's Monday, 4 p.m. Eastern time. Otherwise, we will tune out here. Thank you all for watching. Make sure that you share this if it was helpful to you, and I'll see you guys next weekend. Oh, one more question. I always like to answer the questions. Let me hit this. Would the sacred account be the best place to save for emergency funds versus in the bank? Um, good question. So I would say yes. For me, that is where I keep my, my emergency savings, my reserves go in my sacred account. The banks even put their own reserves in the sacred account. So it is a great place for that. Um, okay, guys, that's all we have for today. We will sign out. Have a great Saturday. Talk to you next time.